The fifth chapter of Matthew, up through verse 12, verses 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. I, uh, I will be honest with you. I don't know if I'm going to watch any football today. Um, if ever there was a game where you wished that the earth could open and swallow both teams, it's probably this one. Um, I, I get it. I get it that there's a lot of people who are really interested. I get it that there is, it's kind of a di- one of those dynasty games, isn't it? Because you've got these, these, te- you know, these great hopes by a couple of teams. You, know, you, you, you want to find out whether if, if Seattle can pull it off and they can, they can establish this dynasty or whether they, they choke again. Um, <coughs> or um, you know, whether, whether New- Tom Brady can cement the reputation as a, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to live or whether New England's hopes will be deflated. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. I just thought that up like 30 seconds ago, and I was so proud. <laughs> but <laughs> I get it. I get why people are interested. And I will admit that while I can sit and roll my eyes at football, I'm a sucker for baseball. So I get it. This is how our culture measures greatness, isn't it? This is how we measure. You, you want to find out how we measure greatness? Look where we put our money. Who do we pay? Who is great in the kingdom of America? Actors, athletes, and people who shovel money from one pile to another. We call them bankers. (laughs) Yeah, this is who we regard as great in the kingdom of America. This is who we pay. Occasionally, occasionally, to our credit as a nation, occasionally we step it up a notch and we recognize other kinds of greatness that are, that are probably a little more genuine. We, sometimes we recognize great heroism. You remember, I mean, you know, 14 years ago, we recognized that the heroism of firefighters and policemen and EMTs and, uh, who, who rushed into buildings that were going to collapse. You know, we saw that and we said, yes, that is greatness. And really it was, genuinely. But give it a year and we're back to football. You know, occasionally we recognize, um, we recognize great, great generosity. We recognize great service. But if you give it time, we're back to the actors again. That's where our hearts are as a culture. I don't have to tell you that this is not where greatness is to be found in the eyes of God, do I? Now, that's not to say that the gifts that are given to a great athlete aren't something to be incredibly thankful for. I mean, you know, these are, these are great God-given talents. The gifts given to adults who are paid to play pretend and to get filmed while doing it, they are real gifts. And they're gifts that we, we give thanks to God for. But this is not where God, greatness is found in the kingdom of God. If we listen to Jesus, this is the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. 
This is Jesus, and if you're reading through, we're, we're preaching through Matthew here, and as you read through Matthew, this is like the inaugural speech that Jesus gives in public. This is really his first utterance, and in his first speech to the world, he says some things that the world cannot hear or understand. He turns the world on its head. Because what Jesus says is not blessed are those who can throw for a record yardage. Not blessed are those who can open with a $100 million weekend in the box office. Not blessed are those who can create secure, you know, security derivatives that, that make billions of dollars. Not blessed are none of those things. You listen to what he says. And, you th- and if you think this is hard to believe now... It was no easier when he said it. First words. He opened his mouth and he taught them saying, first words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That sounds like a cruddy thing to be, doesn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, now, Jesus, you just have, you're, you're yanking our chain. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let me tell you what. By human standards, the meek are the last people you expect to inherit the earth. By human standards, the earth you expect to be inherited by the violent. Or the rich. Either way. Blessed are those for hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, they're not going to be satisfied in this world, are they? Because, I mean, you look around. I, I mean, do you ever get sick of it? Do you ever look around and say, why are people treating each other like this? Why, why are people behaving this way? Why do people do the things that they do? Sometimes you, you wonder, like, you know, from, we've had some examples of this, you know, recently. You know, why, who robs a grocery store at 9 a.m.? Who treats children the way children have been treated, right? Who, 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 who beats babies? Who does some of these things that you see in the news day by day by day? You hunger and you thirst for righteousness in human terms, you're not going to get it. Sure doesn't look that way anyway. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Um, This is how God defines, defines greatness. This is how Jesus is defining those who are blessed in the kingdom of heaven. Not here. I just want to make really clear here. When we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, we're not talking about after we die. We're talking about within the realm of Christ's authority, right? Which extends into this world, but also extends into eternity. We're not talking about the rebellious world. We're not talking about the sinful world. We're talking about under the authority of Jesus Christ. And ultimately... I just, just to show you how this works, I want to focus on, on one of these, really, and that's the, the sixth beatitude here. Blessed are the pure in heart, because this is one of the keys to, to understanding the rest. Blessed are the pure in heart. You notice that what really sticks out here is not anything that we can do on the outside. It's nothing about running really fast, jumping really high, making tons of money, None of those things. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's something that no one can see but God. Blessed are the pure in heart. This is not a new idea that Jesus is giving us. Um, this is something that runs through the Bible from beginning to end with my kids. We, we were reading through uh, 1 Samuel right now during our, our evening Bible readings. Um, and... It's, it's only when you read through it with a, an eight-year-old that you realize how ridiculously violent it is. But, uh, and he loves it. 
constantly people getting their heads cut off, right? And John's all about this. <laughs> but don't tell him I said that, by the way. I'm, I'll be really embarrassed. Um, we're reading through, you read about the, about the anointing of David, right? Saul, the people of Israel, cried out for a king. Samuel went to the Lord and said, Lord, they, they're rejecting me. They're rejecting you. They want a king. And God said, no, no, you go and you give them a king. So Samuel, the prophet, he went and anointed Saul as king. Saul was a good king for about 20 minutes. And then Saul failed miserably. And so God rejected Saul as king over Israel. And he told Samuel to go out and to anoint one of the sons of Jesse of Bethlehem. And that this, this man would be God's anointed and chosen king over Israel. And so Samuel went out to Jesse's farm and he had all these big handsome sons. I wish I could remember all that. One's name was Abinadab. I, know there's, yeah, there's, um, I couldn't, can't remember them all right now, but first three are named. So he had them line up one by one, oldest first, because that's the way the world should work, incidentally. I don't know if any, uh, how many of you are firstborn children, but um, I, read the, I read the Old Testament. I see that the firstborn son gets a double share of the inheritance, and that seems completely right. Doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> It seems like a great plan. I'll be generous to my siblings if they deserve it. Um, <laughs> so he, he had the firstborn first, and, and, and Samuel looked at him, and it said, the Bible says that he was a handsome kid. Big, tall, strong, handsome guy. And Samuel thought to himself, well, this is the guy. Here you go. He looks the part. And the Lord told Samuel, no, it's not him. And the Lord told Samuel, Man looks at outward things, God looks at the heart. Went through seven sons, said, hey, anybody else here? And yeah, there was David who came in out of the field, right, and was anointed king of Israel. Why? Not because of his exterior, not because of anything that anybody else could see, but because the Lord saw that he had a heart for God. Um, likewise, 24th Psalm, uh, David, David asked a question of his own. He said, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? In other words, who's worthy to come into the presence of God? The super holy looking? The rich? The fast? The famous? His answer, he who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. When the Pharisees complained that Jesus' disciples were eating without washing their hands properly, remember what he said? He said that it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, because what comes out of the mouth reveals what's in the heart. I can go on and on and on with this, but again, this is not a new idea that Jesus is, is laying out. This is how God works. He judges not by outward appearances, but by the state of the heart. Now, that really is the trick, isn't it, though? Because you'd say, oh, good, because I'm kind of stumpy and junky and bald. I'm hoping that the heart will get me there, right? Watch out. Watch out. I, people keep, I keep running into people who see this as some kind of biblical loophole, right? They, they look at their r lousy, rotten scoundrel of a brother, and I'm not talking about any of your brothers. It's a theoretical brother, right? They look at their lousy, rotten scoundrel of a brother, and they say, well, yeah, you know what? He's, he's cheated. He's built his way through three states, and they excuse it by saying, oh, deep down, he's a good person, right? He has a good heart. For some reason, it seems easier than outward obedience, but when you think about it, they've got it all wrong. Um, there is absolutely no demand that God can make that is more ridiculously impossible by human standards than a pure heart. 
By comparison, by comparison saying you shall not kill, that's easy. By comparison saying you shall not bear false witness, okay, we can probably pull that off. Not really, but we think we can. But a pure heart. Right? You can imagine a society in which murder has been done away with. But can you imagine a society in which no one gets angry and hateful? Because you remember that that's what Jesus said that the commandment against murder was all about, ultimately, right? He said that anyone who's angry with his brother has already murdered him in his heart, just the same as if he had stabbed him on the corner in broad daylight. Likewise with adultery, said anyone who looks at a woman with, with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her in here and in here. The nastiest, the nastiest part of this demand for purity of heart is that the harder we try, the more we fall into the, the same old trap, right? Um, not to brag, but every once in a while, I am awesome. I like how nobody thinks that's funny. They're all like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> what a jerk that guy is. <laughs> I, I, once in a while, I'm awesome. At least I think I'm awesome. Once in a while, I have a really good day. And I've done something good. And I've gotten, oh, boy, I, was, I helped people. And it was, oh, oh, God, you are so fortunate to have such a glorious servant as Andy Scott. <laughs> and you know, see right there I fell into the trap, right? Right there I fell in the hole. Because just when I think, boy, I've done a pretty good job today, it's all done. It's pride. It's pride. I'm sitting here giving myself credit. In terms of the state of my heart, I'm actually probably a whole lot better off on bad days. Because on bad days, I know who I am. On bad days, I know how far short I have fallen of God's holy standard. On bad days, I'm, I'm begging, Lord, forgive me, I really messed this up. And that's actually a safer spot to be in than the, boy, am I doing well. <laughs> um, our, our best actions, our most noble deeds are never done from absolutely pure motives. Um, even preaching the gospel has its, its dangers. I've told you this story before. I like it. It's kind of a preacher story. Uh, John Bunyan, great English preacher who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He probably had to force to read it in high school at some point or in college. He probably hated it, but it's it good stuff. Um, John Bunyan was once preaching in a church in England, and it had one of these really tall pulpits that you had to climb up in through this spiral staircase, and they sent a deacon up after the service to help him down. And the deacon got to the top of the, the stairs and said, Pastor, that was a great sermon. And Bunyan said, I know the devil already told me. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that was, even in the course of preaching the gospel, he was proud. He was proud of what he had gotten done. And in the process of being proud, he, he blew it. So what hope is there? In human terms, none. None whatsoever. You're all doomed. In human terms. By, on your own efforts. By your own strength, you're all doomed. I kind of like saying that. <laughs> I should wear a sandwich board and hang out outside the Civic Arena. You remember that guy? Does anybody else remember that guy? He was there for like 20 years. <laughs> um... On our own, we don't have any hope of pulling this off. But here's the good news. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. The promise of the gospel is that when we acknowledge our spiritual poverty, blessed are the poor in spirit, when we acknowledge our spiritual poverty, the fact that I've got nothing good in me to earn God's love, and when I acknowledge how poor and I am as a miserable and I, you know, failure of a servant of God, it's there when I recognize that there's nothing in me that I can go to God and say, here's what I've done for you, now reward me. 
It's when I recognize my spiritual poverty, when I stop trying to make it on my own, when I admit my sin and, and, and throw myself on the mercy of God and Jesus Christ. That I am given a righteousness, a purity, and a holiness that is not mine. See, I by myself am not good at being pure of heart, but Jesus, my Savior, is pure of heart. And when I am not trusting in myself, and I am trusting in Him, His purity is counted as mine. God looks at my heart and sees the purity and the beauty and the holiness and the righteousness and the truth of his son. That's glorious stuff. Um, third chapter, Titus. says that Christ gave his, his life on the cross as a payment for sin in order that he might purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. It's not the third chapter, Titus. That's the second chapter, Titus. Anyway, Titus 2, verse 14. So you know, it's from Titus. Anyway. This, this is our hope, right? This is our hope. If we want to see God, we need pure hearts. And if we want pure hearts, we're going to get them not in from ourselves, but from Him. We're going to pray like the psalmist prayed, create a clean heart in me, O God. Trusting in His, his grace. And little by little, that purity grows in us so that we can do the works that come from a pure heart. This is where greatness comes from in the kingdom of God. And ultimately, what, what it boils down to is greatness in the kingdom of God doesn't come from us. So all these things I read, these are not things that occur naturally to human beings. Not to sinful human beings. If you read the Beatitudes and you say, well, yeah, you know, I'm pretty meek, I'm pure of heart. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want to know what you're smoking because I don't know <laughs> where you get this idea. These are not things that come from us. These are things that come from God. These are things that come as a gift imputed to us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. These are things that when we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I've, I have nothing in me to earn your favor, have mercy on me. He gives us his son. And in Jesus, we find, in Jesus, we find purity of heart. In Jesus, we find meekness. In Jesus, we find hunger and thirst for righteousness. We find all those things that he counts blessed. In Jesus, we even find the blessing that comes in mourning. Because in Jesus we find the promise of the resurrection. So, um, enjoy your football game. May the earth swallow up both teams. And may the cities of Boston and Seattle possibly be salted and plowed into the earth. And all these things. But, just remember... This is not really what God counts as greatness. It's impressive. This is not what God counts as greatness. He, we look at, at the exterior things. God looks on the heart. Amen.